do you have in common with a deer, a fox, a ray, and a squid? Like all animals on Earth, you like to eat. Us humans are omnivores, which means we can eat animal and plant matter, so there's a huge range of foods available to us. There are hundreds of nutrients and thousands of different flavors out there. But when you break it down, all kinds of food are doing the same basic job. They provide us with the energy we need to make it through each day. Today, we're going to find out where all the energy comes from by exploring the principle of net primary productivity. I'm Sarah and I will be your guide. To find out where the energy in our food comes from, we need to look far, astronomically far. That's because the energy ultimately comes from the sun, 150 million kilometers away. The sun is constantly blasting the earth with heat, light, and other forms of energy. The more harmful forms are blocked by our atmosphere or magnetic field. The rest of it travels through our atmosphere and keeps the surface hospitable and bright. Obviously, there's a big difference between sunlight and hot dogs. How does the sun's energy end up in food? There are a few steps in between, and the most important one is done by the original green machines, plants and their friends. Plants, algae, and a bunch of other living organisms are able to capture sunlight and use it to build biomass. These organisms are collectively called producers. Biomass measures the amount of living matter found in a given space. Every living thing contributes to biomass, including animals, plants, fungi, and even microscopic bacteria. The ingredients to make biomass, namely water and carbon dioxide, are naturally found on Earth. Sunlight is needed for the producers to combine them in a useful way. This amazing process is called photosynthesis. Of all the sunlight that falls on the Earth's surface, only 1% is used in photosynthesis. The other 99% is mostly absorbed by the ground or reflected back into space, so it can't be captured by the leaves of plants or the bodies of algae. Luckily, the sun puts out so much light that just 1% is enough. The amount of sunlight that is captured by producers is called GPP, Gross Primary Productivity. However, not all of this productivity is converted into biomass. Some of it is used by the plants and processes like growth and cellular respiration. What's left over is stored in the plant's tissues as biomass. That biomass can be transferred to animals that eat the plants known as herbivores. These rabbits are herbivores. They get all of their energy by taking the biomass from their vegetables. The transfer of energy from producers to herbivores is the first step in the global food chain. The amount of energy that gets transferred is called NPP, net primary productivity. Some of that energy is then available for other animals, such as the meat-eating carnivores, to consume. Herbivores eat producers and carnivores eat the herbivores then get eaten themselves by bigger carnivores, and so on. Net primary productivity refers to the energy that allows this whole chain of life to exist. Net primary productivity not only tells us how much energy, or biomass, makes it up the food chain, it's also a strong indicator of the amount of biodiversity in an area. The more species are living somewhere, the more NPP that area will produce. Let's compare some of the Earth's different biomes to see which ones have the highest NPP and which have the lowest. As you might expect, rainforests have the highest primary productivity of any terrestrial biome. This is because they are hot, humid, and teeming with life. Temperate forests also have a fairly high NPP, just not as much as rainforests, as the conditions in rainforests are much more favorable for growing plants. The boreal forests, on the other hand, are cold and receive limited amounts of rainfall. Grasslands and savannas are also affected by low rainfall. All three of these environments are said to have moderate or medium net primary productivity. The least productive biomes on land are deserts and tundra because they have the lowest concentrations of nutrients and the least amount of plant cover. Not much photosynthesis occurs in these environments because only the hardiest of plants can grow in them. There are similar divisions underwater, where NPP varies according to temperature, depth, and a number of other factors. In shallow tropical waters, coral reefs support a staggering amount of biodiversity. 
the corals rely on tiny organisms called zooxanthellae to grow, and zooxanthellae use photosynthesis to produce biomass. Therefore, in water suitable for these corals to grow, net primary productivity is very high and can support huge marine food chains. The open ocean is a very different story. Out here, the water is too deep for tropical corals to grow, as they cannot get enough sunlight below a certain depth. Even though it covers more than 70% of the Earth's surface, this vast expanse has very low NPP per unit of area. As a result, biodiversity in the open ocean is very low compared to the land. Some parts of the interface between land and sea have more NPP than you might expect. In wetlands and estuaries, there is a fantastic mix of nutrients where rivers flowing downhill meet the salty water of the ocean. The ducks swimming in this wetland are a part of a complex food chain that is entirely fueled by the plants in the background absorbing sunshine. By contrast, lakes and rivers tend to have a very low NPP. In rivers, the water generally flows too quickly for plants or algae to grow in it, so there is not much photosynthesis going on. Lakes tend to be poor in nutrients and vulnerable to changes in the rivers that fill them. Here's a summary of the major terrestrial and marine biomes we have looked at. Hopefully you now have a better understanding of what net primary productivity is and how it varies across the surface of the earth. You should be able to answer the following question. Where does the energy in our food come from? It comes from the sun, through plants and animals and onto our dinner plates. Thank you for watching.